Raised by wolves with canine DNA in his blood. Having trained more than 24,000 pets. Helping you and your fur babies thrive. Live in studio, it's Pet Talk Today with Will Bangura. Answering your pet behavior and training questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host and favorite pet behavior expert, Will Bangura. Good Saturday morning, pet lovers, and happy 4th of July weekend. Hope you have a great weekend. Please be safe. Um, We're going to be talking about the 4th of July, even though we did an entire show just a few weeks ago about dogs and firework anxiety. Right now, there's not a lot of time left in order to get your dogs that do have noise sensitivity issues prepared and comfortable with loud noises. So we're going to talk about, okay, you didn't do the work of getting your dog ready for the 4th of July, the real work of desensitization. What can you do now with the remaining time that you have? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Also today, we're going to be talking about anxiety, just dog anxiety in general, and how that has increased and how much that has increased um, over the last two years, looking at some of the numbers from COVID and talking about what are some of the things that we can do. Um, Boy, I'll tell you what, um, separation anxiety has gone way, way, way up. Um, Noise sensitivity anxiety has gone way up in the last two years. Um, In addition to that, fear of strangers has just exploded, no pun intended, with the sound of the fireworks in the background, but that has exploded. Um, So we're going to be talking about different kinds of anxiety as well. And we're going to be talking about myths, myths related to separation anxiety. We're going to sort out the fact from the fiction. Um, We're going to be talking about a technique for dogs with sound sensitivities called treat party. And how do you implement treat party And what is Treat Party all about? Uh, Do me a favor, everybody. Please hit that like button. Go ahead, hit that like button. Show me some love. Also, please go ahead and show us some love by hitting that share button so that more people can, can benefit from what we do here at Pit Talk today. I also want to be able to take time to answer your questions. So if you've got a question about your dog's behavior, if you've got a problem with your dog, doesn't matter what kind of dog you have, doesn't matter what kind of breed, doesn't matter uh, the problem or the age of dog, do me a favor. If you've got a question, go ahead and type your question into the comments section down below. And also, please let us know where you're watching from and what kind of pets that you have. Okay. Yeah. Just go ahead and do that. We'll be happy to help you with your, with your questions. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the 4th of July. So this is July one and we've got just a few days till the 4th of July. Now, if you've got a dog that has noise sensitivity, if you've got a dog that has a fear of fireworks, chances are if you have not been working on what we call counter conditioning and desensitization, exposure therapy to the sounds of fireworks. If you've not been working on that for quite a while, your dogs are probably not going to be in a good place on the 4th of July, during the 4th of July weekend, as the noises start to come about. There's a lot of different things that can happen, right? They can start panting, they can start pacing, They can start trembling. They can start drooling. uh, They can try to escape, to try to run away. Uh, Some dogs get frantic. They'll break through windows. They'll uh, get outside. They'll crawl underneath gates or fences. The 4th of July and the 4th of July weekend is the busiest weekend of the year at every single dog shelter throughout the country. Every single dog shelter throughout the country they are going to absolutely be bombarded. And you never think that it's going to be your dog out of panic and and pure fear and frustration 
of the fireworks sound and the anxiety that they're going to get out, that they're going to escape. But they do. So let's talk about safety right now, okay? That's the thing. If you've not done the work, let's talk about safety. And I'm going to let you know how to do the work also. We did a show, let's see, it was just a few weeks ago. That was episode 97. Now, you've got to go to the audio Pet Talk Today podcast. You'll have to go to Google, um, put in Pet Talk Today podcast, um, you know, Apple podcast, um, Spotify, um, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, you name it. You can go to any of those. But look for the Pet Talk Today audio podcast. Look for episode 97. Episode 97, I go into detail talking about dogs with firework anxiety. We talk about, hey, how do we deal with this long term? How do we get them comfortable with the sound of fireworks? Also, you can go to episode 98, which is all about counter conditioning and desensitization. It's a brand new episode that I did on counter conditioning and desensitization. The old one was episode 81. So now we've got two great episodes. So you've got about three hours between the two episodes, episode 82, episode 98, on how do you expose your dogs that have fears, anxieties, phobias, aggression, reactivity? Well, that's counter-conditioning and desensitization. That's exposing your dogs to the triggers that cause their fears, their anxieties, their phobias, their reactivity or aggression, but doing it in such a way that doesn't get them to react and teaches them to start to get used to those fears those triggers, the things that cause them to be afraid or reactive or aggressive. So counter conditioning and desensitization is the golden tool for addressing and dealing with all fears and anxiety. So make sure you check out episode 98, episode 81 on counter conditioning and desensitization, and specifically episode 97 on how you help your dog with fireworks. Okay. Um, We need to take a moment to talk about our sponsor, Calm Dogs. And Calm Dogs is not just the sponsor of the show, but Calm Dogs is the world's best dog anxiety calming aid on the planet, or it's free. And Calm Dogs is something that I, that's right, myself, Will Bangura, have developed. It took me five years to develop this calming supplement. Now, it's non-sedating. It's not going to knock your dog out like medications, and that's why a lot of people like this. But it also can take some time to work. It's similar to some of the very powerful medications out there, but without the unwanted side effects. If your dog has problems with anxiety, fears, phobias, fireworks, storms, aggression, car rides, grooming, vet visits, or any other problem that's related to fear, anxiety, reactivity, or aggression, check out my supplement, Calm Dogs. I am so confident that my supplement can help your dog. It comes with a 100% money back guarantee. Try Calm Dogs for 45 days. It's something that you've got to take twice daily for two weeks, but 98% of dog owners reported that their dogs had reduced anxiety, reduced fear, phobias, and aggression when taken twice daily for six weeks. So check out Calm Dogs. You can get Calm Dogs at calmdogs.com or doganxiety.com. That's calmdogs.com or doganxiety.com. All right, so we're going to be talking about the fireworks stuff. What can you do for your dog right now? Well, right now, it's about keeping your dog safe. Right now, it's about trying to keep your dog calm. If you've got a dog that gets really frantic, you know, let's, let's just say that the anxiety for fireworks has different levels. Mild, moderate, severe. What would severe be? Well, severe for me is a dog that's going to be trembling. A dog that's going to be panting frantically. A dog that might be pacing and running around. A dog that has its tail tucked. Look at their breathing. Look at their pupils. How dilated are their pupils? Even if you shine a flashlight in them. So that's going to be something very severe. Okay, Moderate, well, let's just take what I just talked about and turn that down about 50%. And then mild anxiety, well, they're bothered by it. Maybe they run in the house, but once they're in the house, they're okay. And then there are some dogs that's so severe, they panic so bad, they don't want to go back outside for the next 10 days. And I'm serious about this. Very, very, very serious about this. 
Um, so there's a few things that we can do. Number one, if you've got a dog that has severe anxiety, if you've got a dog that has big problems on the 4th of July, then there's probably not a supplement out there if you've got a severe case of noise phobias and fears, there's probably not a supplement out there that's going to do anything for you today. One of the reasons I developed Calm Dogs was because none of the other stuff that made claims that were natural out there worked. All of it was garbage. But it's not magic. Even medications, certain medications, they're not going to work. Some of them are going to take time. So all we can do right now to try to help a dog be calm if they've got severe anxiety is perhaps, no, I'm not a veterinarian. I'm not giving out veterinary advice. That's really important for you to hear that. Okay. But based on my experience as a professional dog trainer and as a certified behavior consultant, working with a lot of veterinarians, working with lots of dogs with these kind of fears, working with a lots of behavioral medicine, what I can tell you is right now there are some medications that you can use that may or may not Help your dog relax. These type medications, these situational medications are sedating, typically sedating medications. Celio, how do you spell Celio? S-I-E. Wait a minute. (laughs) How do you spell Celio? S-E-L-I-O. 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 Celio. It's a medication that is actually a a gel that is in like a a syringe. You squirt a little gel between the dog's cheek and its gum, and it starts to work very quickly. It's FDA approved for noise sensitivities. It's something that really doesn't sedate too bad either. The Celio is a really good medication. You can talk to your vet to see if Celio is appropriate for your dog. Other medications that a lot of veterinarians use, and again, I'm not a veterinarian. I'm not giving out medical advice. I'm just sharing with you some things that you might discuss with your vet if you've got a dog with severe fear to the sound of fireworks. So there's not any time to desensitize. You can talk to your vet about medications like gabapentin that we use that helps with anxiety. It sedates. Uh, trazodone, we use that. It sedates. But here's the thing. Some dogs, that sedation is going to help calm them. Some dogs, they're going to feel that sedation and it's going to freak them out. They're going to get more anxious because they feel like they're losing their faculties and they don't know why. So if you don't know what your dog is like on some kind of sedating medication and you want to use it for the 4th of July, my suggestion is talk to your vet about this. But I've had a lot of veterinarians tell my clients, hey, Give it to your dog before the 4th of July. See how your dog responds to it. Not only to see, does it have a paradoxical effect, making them more anxious, but is it at the right dosage? Did it help the dog or did it sedate so much that the dog was completely unconscious? So if you've got a dog with severe, severe noise sensitivity and we're this close to the 4th of July, check with your veterinarian. Check with your veterinarian, okay? Other things that can help mildly, uh, compression vest, thunder shirt. Again, with a lot of these things, it can go one way or the other. Some dogs are going to get more nervous when you put a thunder shirt or a compression vest on them. Some dogs, it's going to help relax them more, okay? Now, you can go out, believe it or not, you can buy noise-canceling headphones for dogs, You can buy noise-canceling headphones for dogs. Let's see if I can bring this up here uh, real quick here just to kind of get a peek at that. Um, So, yeah, you can get noise-canceling headphones. But the problem with that is a lot of dogs are going to be very nervous about putting noise-canceling headphones on if you haven't taken the time to desensitize and counter-condition them to that. Um, but it might be something that really helps. And, and when you've got a dog that has severe noise sensitivity, when we start exposing them to sound, some of these dogs are wearing noise-canceling headphones so we can bring that sound so low that they don't care. And some dogs, we can't get it low enough. We just cannot get it low enough. 
Um, so that is something that you can possibly do. Um, some dogs are going to benefit, a few, are going to benefit from um, dog appeasing pheromone. In the litter, the mother dog produces a pheromone that helps calm and relax the puppies. Well, we've synthesized this pheromone, this dog appeasing pheromone that mama dogs make, and we've put it in a bottle. And um, you can look for dog appeasing pheromone. Not every dog it's going to help. Some dogs it's going to help. Some dogs it's not going to help. Let's also talk about safety. If you don't have a collar on your dog with an ID tag, and you've got a dog that's very anxious and fearful on the 4th of July, I know you think they're not going to escape, but they do. Make sure that you've got an ID tag on your dog. If you've got a dog that's afraid of fireworks, make sure you stay home. Stay home with your dog. Don't crate them. Stay home with them. If you've got a dog that's got severe fear and anxiety with fireworks, one of the things that you're going to want to do also is say, hey, are they microchipped? Now, maybe you've got time, if they're not, to get a microchip between now and then. If you've got a dog that has severe anxiety and you might need some medication or want to talk to your vet about that, hey, kill two birds with one stone. Get in, get some medication for your dog. Also get them microchipped. And again, a lot of dogs escape. This is the busiest weekend of the entire year all across the country in every shelter that's out there. Now, the other thing that we need to do is talk about, okay, is there a way to mitigate the sound once it starts? Well, again, the noise-canceling headphones can help. The medication can help, okay? Um, one of the things that I like to do is I always ask people, do you have a walk-in closet? And even if you don't have a walk-in closet, Think about a closet. It's a small room. Usually there's lots of clothes in there. So it's like a soundproof, sound dampening room. That's what the closets are like. So if you go into your closet, chances are that's going to be the quietest room anywhere in the house. So that's where I'm going to go with my dog if I've got a dog that's panicking. Also, I'm going to try to drown out the sound of the fireworks with other noise. I might have a white noise machine or just have it on my phone. I might play music, dogs. At least the research says that their preference as far as music is reggae. So I might start playing reggae uh, to help drown out the sound as well. Um, another thing you can do is you can go into the bathroom. The bathroom is typically a quiet area of the house. You can turn on the cold water in the bathtub as noise in the background as well. If your dog likes to play with puzzle games, if your dog likes to play with toys, bring the toys with you. Try to keep your dog engaged with you. Try to keep your dog moving. Fast movement helps to dissipate some stress, okay? Um, but don't push your dog outside and say, hey, the dog's just got to get used to it. Let's make them get used to it. That's flooding. That will just ruin your relationship with your dog. Get your dog out of the danger. Get your dog to the quietest place you can. Have some background noise playing. Talk to the vet about possible medication to help your dog. In the long term, for the next time there's fireworks, whether that be on um, New Year's, whether that be on Memorial Day, whether that be on the 4th of July. Uh, next time, be prepared because it takes three, four, five, six months of work with counter conditioning and desensitization to be able to really make some in-ground in terms of helping a dog that has a lot of sound sensitivities a lot of fears and phobias. It's going to take about three to six months of work, working with your dog about three to five times a week, doing counter conditioning and desensitization exercises. And those last about five or 10 minutes. They're not long training exercises. Um, in general, now this is just a little piece. It's more complicated than this, but counter conditioning and desensitization is the gradual systematic exposure to a trigger, but at a level that is so mild and benign that the dog doesn't have a care in the world. And you present that trigger to the dog at that low level of concern, 
And when they see that trigger, you start feeding very high value food rewards constantly and continuously paired with that trigger for about three to five seconds. Then the trigger goes away. So if it's a sound, the sound goes away and we stop feeding. Then we might start playing fireworks again, recorded sounds at a very low volume, a volume that your dog does not have a care in the world about. There's no anxiety, but your dog can hear it. I press play. I'm going to start feeding constantly and continuously high value food rewards for about one to three seconds. I'm going to press stop and I'm going to stop feeding. And I'm going to pair that back and forth over and over so that the dog understands that the reason the really good stuff, the high value food rewards are coming is because of the sound of the fireworks, because that's the only time it happens. And I make that very clear, a very black and white cause and effect association with time. The sound of fireworks brings about high value food rewards that the dog loves. When those sounds stop, those wonderful high value food rewards stop. And again, I'm going to do that over and over, a five-minute session, three to five times a week. And it's probably going to take me between three to six months to go from a very low volume to as loud as it can possibly go. And I still may need to use a supplement like Calm Dogs or medication, even if I'm doing that, if I've got a super, super severe case. Because if you can't get the volume low enough, to get the dog to an emotional state where it is not experiencing any anxiety. You can't do the work. And there are dogs out there where it's that severe. And that's one of the reasons that we need to use medication in some cases. Um, so check out um, a couple of the Pet Talk Today audio podcasts by doing a Google search for Pet Talk Today podcast, uh, episode 97, our podcast on fireworks episode 98 and episode 81. Those are our plus long episodes on counter conditioning and desensitization. And those two will help you with any problem that is related to anxiety, fears, phobias, reactivity, or aggression, not just, not just sound sensitivities. Um, okay. So I wanted to talk about something a little bit um, specific when it comes to counter conditioning and desensitization something specific when it comes to counter conditioning and desensitization. Um, and it is a particular technique that is called treat party. And you can go to my website at dogbehaviorist.com. That's dogbehaviorist.com. Go to um, the menu and then scroll down, click on articles. And then you can look for this article, Treat Party, Training Protocol for Dogs with Sound Sensitivities. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole article. That's for you to do. Okay. But I want to kind of talk about how Treat Party works. So let's go through the instructions. The Treat Party protocol is based on the principles of positive reinforcement. Now, what are some of the things you're going to need? Well, you're going to need a treat pouch full of high value treats that your dog loves, such as cut up cooked chicken or small pieces of hot dog. The first step is to drop something and make a noise. Now, when you do this, you need to get excited and say, oh, what was that? Treat party. Again, you drop something. I know it sounds silly. You drop something, you make a noise. And when you do this, you get excited and you say, what was that treat party? Get excited. Then you immediately are going to toss a few treats on the floor. You're going to have fun and play with your dog. Now, when those treats are eaten, you're just going to repeat that process. Now, at any time, if your dog seems concerned or anxious because of the sounds, it means that you're moving too quickly and you need to back up to quieter sounds. We're going to be doing this gradually, increasing the sound level. The treat party protocol starts with very quiet sounds. And like I said, we gradually increase the volume and intensity over the course of several weeks. And in some cases, if it's very severe, it could be several months. Each week, or as we're going along, we're going to introduce new sounds and different items, starting with soft toys, 
or balls and gradually moving on to louder sounds. The larger uh, things that make louder noises or the things that we're playing on uh, speakers, we then will go to moderate volume sounds. So week one, this is kind of a sample protocol. Week one, we're going to start with very quiet sounds. Well, what are some quiet sounds that we could possibly create by dropping things? Soft toys or balls, lightweight cardboard boxes, soft covered books or magazines, fabric or felt items such as gloves or hats, small plastic containers or bottles with lids securely fastened. We don't want your dogs swallowing the lids. Empty plastic bags or paper bags, soft pillows or cushions, stuffed animals or plush toys. So again, those are some examples of very quiet sounds. So what are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and we are going to drop these quiet sounding items. We're going to drop it and we're going to go, oh, oh, treat party. You're going to get excited. You're going to start dropping some treats and you're going to play with your dog and you have a really, really good time. Now, again, that soft item you dropped, if it was something that startled your dog, you've got to find something quieter because then you're going too quickly. You have to back up a little bit. All right, getting back to our list. Again, week one, some things we can drop. And as soon as it makes the noise, we go, oh, oh, treat party. And you have fun with your dog. You drop some treats and you start playing. Soft toys or balls, lightweight cardboard boxes, soft covered books or magazines, fabric or felt items such as gloves or hats, small plastic containers or bottles, empty plastic bags or paper bags, soft pillows or cushions, stuffed animals or plush toys. Now, week two. We're going to go to a little bit louder, but still quiet sounds. Well, what are some examples of things that we can drop and create the sound? Again, we drop the item. It makes a sound. As soon as the sound happens, we go, oh, oh, treat party. Real excitable. And we drop some treats on the floor. Very high value. Cooked chicken, cut up pieces of hot dog, cooked beef, something they absolutely love. But anyway, some other things that we can drop that are a little bit louder. Medium-sized plastic containers or bottles. Small or medium-sized metal objects such as keys, coins, or metal spoons. Medium-sized cardboard boxes or containers. Plastic or metal bowls or plates. Hard-covered books or magazines. Empty plastic containers such as yogurt or margarine tubs. Medium-sized wooden or plastic toys. Those are some of the things that you can do. Do that for about a week. And again, as you're going to louder, heavier objects, if your dog gets startled or shows any concern, Back up to the quieter objects. Spend more time working on that. Now, week three, we're going to go to slightly louder sounds. Crinkly plastic or paper bags or wrappers. Small or medium-sized balls or toys made of harder materials such as rubber or hard plastic. Small or medium-sized metal bells. Small or medium-sized glass jars or bottles. Uh, again, here, make sure those lids are securely fastened. Uh, noisy toys or objects with a medium or high-pitched sound. Now, be careful not to create too much noise and scare your dog. Again, we need to do this gradually. And every time that noise happens, that's going to be the cue. You're going to go, oh, 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 what was that? Treat party. And you start giving your dog some of those high-value foods. Now, as we get to week four, Notice this is gradual and systematic, folks. You cannot rush through this. It will not work. You can only go as fast as your dog's pace. Week four, we're going to then go to medium-sized metal bells, medium-sized glass jars or bottles, small or medium-sized plastic or metal buckets, noisy toys or objects with high-pitched sounds. But again, be careful not to create too much noise and scare the dog. That is not the goal of this. We want, we want to keep the dog below threshold. When we're presenting this, again, if the dog shows care, concern, worry, anxiety, stress, you have gone to a sound that is too loud too soon. You need to back up, do more work on the quieter sounds. Week five, we go to even louder sounds. Large plastic containers or buckets, large metal pans or baking sheets, smaller, medium-sized wooden or a metal xylophone. So, How many of you have a xylophone? I know I don't. Small or medium-sized plastic or metal drums. Hopefully you've got kids. Loud noisemakers such as party horns, whistles. Again, 
with the caveat, be careful as you're going louder, not to go so loud too soon that your dog gets nervous. Week six, now we're going to go to some very loud sounds, large metal bells or chimes, large glass jars or bottles, large plastic or metal buckets, large noisemakers such as air horns. Yes, even an air horn. If you do this slow enough, if you do this gradually enough, systematically enough, yes, you can get your dog used to just about any sound, just about anything. Um, As you go through the article, and again, where do you go for the article? Go to my website at dogbehaviorist.com, go to the menu, scroll down, find articles, click on articles, then look for treat party training protocol for dogs with sound sensitivities. Okay. Um, So that is one of the things that we teach our clients um, to do. That's one of many things that you can do to begin to help your dog. It's kind of an offshoot. It involves counter conditioning and desensitization, but in a very specific way um, as it relates to um, noise phobias, um, as it relates to using counter conditioning and desensitization um, to help your dogs with their fears, phobias, and anxieties. Um, I'm Will Bangura, and you're listening to Pet Talk today here on Facebook Live. I'm here each and every Saturday morning at 11 o'clock Eastern time for an hour where I answer your questions and talk about relative topics in dog training and behavior. If you've got a question about your dog's behavior, if you've got a question about your dog's training, do me a favor Go ahead and type it into the comments section below. Let me know where you're watching from and also what kind of pets that you have. Um, Also, do me a favor, hit that like button, hit that share button so that more people can benefit from what we do at Pet Talk today. Also, if you listen to our podcast on one of the podcast platforms, please do us a favor. Give us a five-star review if you like what we do. Um, The reviews are really how you rank. And the more reviews you have, the higher you rank, and that way the more people can benefit from it. Um, Why do you want to review this podcast? Because the more reviews we have, the higher we rank, the more we are able to bring you. So just take a minute out of your time, take a minute out of your day, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or any of the other podcast listening platforms that you go to. Let me take a look um, and see here if we have any questions in the queue. As I go through here, we'll check it out. Um, All right, so I've got Sis, and she says, I'm a trainer who currently has a reactive dog that I put on Calm Dogs. It works amazingly as a tool. Thanks for the, well, wow, I am so grateful. That is such a great uh, endorsement. You know, I can say things all day long about Calm Dogs, but Sis, if you look at the comments in the feed, Um, She's a trainer and she is a reactive dog that you put on calm dogs and it works amazing. So check out calm dogs. If you've got a dog that's reactive, if you've got a dog that's aggressive, if you've got a dog with fears, anxieties, and phobias, check out calm dogs, go to calmdogs.com or doganxiety.com. Comes with a 100% money back guarantee. You've got nothing to lose. There's no risk. I take it all away by giving you that money back guarantee. That's how confident that I am that the Calm Dogs will help your dog. It helps your dog or it's free. That's my simple promise to you. Well, thanks, sis. I appreciate that. And of course, sis knows this. There's no pill. I don't care if it's a medication. I don't care if it's a supplement. There's no pill that's going to change your dog 100%. It's always best, always going to work best. If you do behavior modification and training along with the aid of a supplement or medication. So that's really, really, really critical that you're not just depending upon a supplement or medication. You've got to do the work as well. Um, Christine, um, Chris is from South Carolina. She says she's got a golden and a lab. We walk every day, and I'm curious your thoughts about sniff walks versus regular walks. I let them sniff when they want without pulling. They get exercise uh, running in the dog pen. Yeah, Christine, sniff walks are absolutely critical. Um, Not letting your dog have a sniff walk is like taking your child and making them wear a mask on their eyes all day long. 
dogs, 90% of their world is through their nose. Think about this. They can smell one drop of blood a mile away. They make sense out of the world with their nose. It is so important for their mental and physical stimulation and enrichment. So sniff walks are critical. Um, Those of you that are just walking your dogs like a little militant uh, marching band up and down the sidewalk, um, that's great too. We need to have control. We need to have focus with our dogs. But boy, they need to be able to just get around and sniff and, and do their thing. So um, great point, Christine. Thanks for bringing that up. I don't talk much about sniff walks. Um, everybody wants their dog not to pull. And, you know, when they're doing sniff walks, sometimes they're pulling. But if it's safe, hey, why not put a harness on? Why not get a 20-foot long leash? Not a retractable either. Those can be dangerous. But you can get like 20-foot long leashes, 15-foot leashes, 30-foot leashes. Okay? Um, let's see. Christine also says, my lab is not very confident. I try to walk them separately to help build this confidence, any confidence building exercises I can do. Well, Christine, here's the thing. A lot of times we're walking our dogs or we're exposing our dogs to the triggers that they're afraid of and they're experiencing that fear. And one of the things that people don't realize, they think that I can bring my dog in that state of fear and maybe start feeding my dog treats or distracting my dog with treats when it's in that state of fear in front of that trigger and things are going to get better. And let me tell you, that doesn't happen. Things don't get better or it takes forever and things only get a little bit better. And the reason is, is because when you expose your dog in a way to try to desensitize them to a trigger, that trigger has to be so benign that your dog has zero stress, zero anxiety. Your dog does not have a care in the world. Oh, they see the trigger or they hear the trigger, but it's low enough in volume or far enough away in distance, they don't care. And when we're doing counter conditioning and desensitizing, when we're doing exposure therapy, that's what we call keeping them below threshold. We have to do the work. We have to do the exposing of the trigger when the dog's emotional state is calm, relaxed, loose, can listen to you, can focus on you, respond to commands, is willing to take food, and doesn't have a care in the world. And gradually and systematically, we get closer and closer and closer over time if it's a visual trigger, like a fear of people or dogs. If it's an auditory trigger, the sound of fireworks, the sound of scary trucks, the sound of gunshots, the sound of the fire alarm, the sound of the garbage disposal, the leaf blower, you get the idea. Doesn't matter what the sound is. You've got to start at a super low volume that the dog doesn't care and start teaching the dog, hey, that sound, that sound brings about incredible positive things, yummy food items. And you're pairing that and associating that over and over and over. But if you've got a severe case, get a professional trainer. You're going to need a helper. This is not easy stuff. I've got articles um, on dogbehaviors.com. Like I said, we've got the podcast episode um, 97 and episode 82 that are related to, oh, no, 98, episode 98 and episode 81, counter conditioning and desensitization. I don't want to get that wrong. All right, let's go back to the questions here. Um, Yeah, so Christine, getting back to your question about your lab not being very confident, um, We need, and this is for everybody, the first step to dealing with any trigger, the first step in dealing with any fear, phobia, anxiety, reactivity, the first step is to avoid all triggers. I know, you don't want to hear that. It's not the fix, but it's the first step to the fix. You have to avoid all the triggers. You are not going to help your dog if it keeps experiencing the fears the reactivity, the aggression, the anxiety. You're not going to help your dog until it stops rehearsing those behaviors and it stops having that 
association that those things are bad, that those things are scary. It just keeps getting more and more ingrained, more and more conditioned. We have to present those triggers in a way where we can manipulate the distance so that we can start at a distance where your dog doesn't have anxiety. We need to be able to manipulate the triggers, expose those triggers in a way when it's a sound that we can present it to start with quiet enough, low enough, where the dog doesn't have anxiety. So we can start creating positive associations very gradually and systematically. So, Christine, you're going to want to check out um, the audio podcast number 98 and number 82 on counter conditioning and desensitization. If you go to the dogbehaviorist.com website, if you go to the articles, if you find the article on counter conditioning and desensitization, at the bottom of the article is the video podcast from right here from Facebook that I did on June 12th which is the audio podcast episode 98. So you can actually see the video podcast on counter conditioning and desensitization that's embedded into the article at dogbehaviorist.com. Also, just a little selfish uh, promotion. If you guys do need to work with a professional, I do behavior consultations all throughout the world. You can get in touch with me at dogbehaviorist.com. Um, so V says, I've got a Yorkie Terrier that doesn't walk well on a leash. He pulls so much uh, so we never get very far. If I go past the street in front of my house, he does very well. If I go back and forth, but he is not getting the exercise from long walks. Uh, so he has, let's open this up. He has a lot more energy and runs around inside my house with crazy energy. I do play in the yard with him, but he still has a lot of energy. Any suggestions? Well, the... There's a couple things. One of the things, teaching a dog not to pull on the leash doesn't happen by going for a long walk. And that's the way a lot of people just try to do it. They, they start off by, hey, I want to go for a walk with my dog. And they start walking. And the dog starts pulling. And maybe you've got this little tug of war thing going on with the dog. And if your dog's wearing a flat collar, maybe the dog's coughing and choking. And now you're getting concerned for good reason. And then you go out and you buy a harness so that your dog doesn't cough, doesn't get hurt. And now you find only the harness isn't helping the dogs pulling more. Well, yeah, the harness is meant so that dogs can pull comfortably. Think about sled dogs. It's not necessarily, the harness isn't necessarily going to help the dog not pull. It might make the dog pull more because it's not uncomfortable or not as uncomfortable. Your job, if you want to get a dog to walk without pulling, your job is to teach the dog to follow you on a walk, follow you. And the only way that you teach a dog to follow you is by making a lot of turns. Anytime your dog isn't focused on you, turn 180 degrees away from your dog. When your dog turns to follow you, click and reward or mark and reward. If you don't know what I mean when I say click and reward or mark and reward, you need to learn about what a marker training system is. We use markers to communicate with dogs when they've done something wrong because timing is absolutely critical. You can learn about marker training or learn about clicker training by going to the audio Pet Talk Today podcast, by doing a Pet Talk Today podcast search, looking for episode 80. Episode 80 is all about clicker training or marker training. So check that out as well. But you've got to teach the dog to follow you. Turn away from the dog. The dog turns to follow you as it starts to get up to you. Click and reward. Make another turn. As the dog turns to follow you, click and reward. Never let the dog get in front of your knee. If those eyes get in front of your knee, the dog's leading on the walk because they can't even see you now. That's another big mistake. You let your dog get too far in front of you. Hey, if this is not a sniff walk, if you want to have your dog walking in the heel position, not pulling on the leash, it's about teaching your dog to follow. Start doing that in the hallway of your home. If you need to start to lure your dog with food, lure the dog with you with food to begin with. Lure the dog if you have to. You can put food in a ladle. Hold that by your side and have the dog follow you. 
but you shouldn't even have to do that. Your dog, if you turn away from your dog 180 degrees, like you're on a straight, imagine that we painted a straight line. We're walking on a straight line. The dog's next to us, next to us, rather than start walking forward, and you know your dog's going to pull, stop at. Start by turning away from the dog immediately. Turn away from the dog 180 degrees on a straight line. The dog will be behind you now. And then it's going to start to try to catch up. Now, if you don't do anything from the time you turn till the time the dog catches up, it's going to get in front of you and start pulling again. Your job is to watch where those eyes are as those eyes get to your leg. Make a U-turn 180 degrees as the dog then catches up to you. Click and reward. Start in the house. Then go into your backyard with few to no distractions. Then go out to the front yard, few to minimal distractions. Then go in your neighborhood with little distractions. And then little by little, you get yourself to more and more heavier distractions, more complicated, more challenging distractions for your dog. But you've got to do that gradually and systematically. If you lose control of your dog as you're working in distractions, it's just like the counter conditioning and desensitization. It was too much for your dog. You didn't fail. The dog didn't fail. You just need to present and do the work in an environment that is not as distracting until the dog really has that, really has it. See, a lot of you don't realize it takes a lot more, a lot more repetition than you think. It takes a lot more repetition than you think. Um, all right, let's go down into other Questions that we have here. <laughs> yeah, you know, as far as the energy and the exercise, V, um, a lot of dogs, they just get a little bit of exercise on a walk because they are really are sprinters. They need to be sprinting for about 20 minutes every day. So if your dog loves to chase a ball, hey, throwing that ball in the backyard for 20 minutes a day is going to be better exercise. But I do want your dog going out for walks. Um, start working on that loose leash healing. Okay. Um, Katie says, how do I get my puppy to stop play biting my other dog? Well, you know, Katie dogs in the womb between ages of three and five weeks of age, that's where they learn bite inhibition. If they're biting too hard on the nipple of mom, mom's going to correct them. If they're biting too hard on a litter mate, that litter mate's going to go, yep. And that kind of startles the biting puppy when they hear that high pitch yip. And that kind of serves as feedback. Hey, that was, that was biting too hard. So one of the things I like to tell people to do is, hey, when your puppy is biting your other dog, make that sound. Interrupt that behavior. But then I want you to give your dog something else to do. Call your dog to you and reward your dog. Keep doing that. Every time the puppy is trying to do that, make that yip sound, interrupt the puppy, call the puppy to you, reward the dog. Now, you've got to be more rewarding. You've got to be more motivating. You've got to be more interesting to the puppy than the dog is. So you've got to figure out a way to create engagement with that puppy when you're doing this, okay? Um, start getting the dog trained, start with basic commands, start with getting the dog conditioned to a clicker, to a marker. If you don't know what marker training is again, go to episode 80 of the pet talk today podcast. Okay. Um, but that's one of the things that, that you need to do with, with that particular, uh, situation, um, is interrupt the behavior, give the puppy something else to do. I would work on that recall. I'd work on that come command when your dog is not engaging with your older dog because you want to create that foundation. You know, you can start capturing behaviors. Capturing is a great way to begin training and shaping behaviors with young puppies. Capturing is a principle where you watch the puppy and of course, when you have a puppy, you need to watch them, right? They need to be supervised. They're puppies. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to have accidents. They're going to be destructive, right? We've got to teach them what to do. Anytime a puppy does a behavior that we like, maybe it sits 100 times a day on its own, lays down 100 times a day on its own. Capture, 
the dog doing the behavior of lying down and label that down as the puppy is giving that behavior, as the puppy's offering lying down on its own. You didn't ask for it. You go down and then mark and reward, click and reward. What you're doing is you're reinforcing the behaviors that you want and you like. You're labeling them, making associations so that eventually you have them on cue or command and can ask for them. But you're not just going to tell a dog that knows no association between laying down and the word down, down, and expect them to go down. It's not going to happen. But we can capture all kinds of behaviors. A dog picks up a ball. I can say fetch every time they pick up the ball and reward them. And before long, I can say fetch, ask for it, and boom, they get it. And Guess what? I can do the same thing with drop. Drop. How many of you need your dog to drop and it doesn't? Well, your dogs pick up things all day long and they drop things all day long. How about every time they pick something up on their own and every time they drop something on their own, you label it fetch when they pick it up, drop when they drop it, and you click and reward, you mark and reward. You can teach so many things to a young puppy. They're like sponges by doing shaping. So I, you know, I've got, matter of fact, I've got a full article on shaping. I've got a full article on capturing. Again, go to the dogbehaviors.com website, my website, go to the article section, find that article on capturing. It's a great way, a fun way uh, to train. Um, let's see. Ash says, coming from Easton, Pennsylvania, I have a pure American bully that's very scared of fireworks and thunderstorms. He's also very aggressive towards people and other animals, wildlife uh, included. My girlfriend has mental health issues and something about her triggers him to sometimes try and attack her. He will circle her like a shark, then jump up, growl, and snarl. I've had multiple trainers tell me he's too old to try and fix his issues. He's nine years old. He'll be 10 years old in November. Well, Ash, um, there is no dog that is too old. The only time we can't help a dog is one of two things. Either they've got such bad physical problems that interfere with what we need to do, or they're so old or have an injury that they've got huge cognitive deficits like dementia, Alzheimer's, which dogs can get. Aside from that, you can train any dog. Your dog is not too old. But one of the first things that I need to say to you in order to help you, Ash, you need to make an appointment with your veterinarian. This is severe. First thing you need to do is rule out there are no physical things. Make sure there's no pain. Pain is a huge contributing factor to aggression. Always rule out that there's no pain issues. Get some basic blood work done. Make sure there's nothing else going on with your dog. What you're telling me, Ash, I really recommend that you get help from a professional. Now, you're looking at the wrong people. The dog training industry is not regulated. Anybody can say they're a dog trainer and have absolutely no experience and no knowledge. Now, most trainers, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they're very well-intentioned, but very few have any good formal education. Very few are behaviorist or behavior consultants, and you need a behaviorist or you need a certified behavior consultant. Now, you can look up certified dog behavior consultant. You can look up certified behavior consultant canine. But you need to find a behavior consultant. Or you can look up certified dog behaviorist. Trainers are more into teaching dogs obedience commands. How to sit, lay down, come when called. And nuisance behaviors. How to stop jumping and barking. When it comes to fears, anxieties, phobias, aggression, and reactivity, severe problems, separation anxiety, you need to be dealing with a certified behavior consultant or a certified behaviorist. Regular trainers oftentimes don't know what to do, and they're going to tell you information that's just wrong. Again, I can help you. I work with people all over the world with these kind of problems. We have success all the time all the time. 
So you can go to dogbehaviors.com, reach out to me if you can't find anybody in your area. Obviously, you need to be listening to some of the podcasts that I talked about because we talked a lot about how do you help these dogs? And that's going to be with counter conditioning and desensitization. So uh, those podcasts that I mentioned, the audio podcast, um, episode 98, episode 81 of the Pet Talk Today podcast, uh, those are the things that you want to check out um, as well. Um, good. They're seeing a vet. Second, seeing a certified behavior consultant. Well, hopefully, uh, da, 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 da. hang on a second. Oh, okay. So sis, you're doing a good job. You're kind of helping Katie there. Perfect. I was thinking that was another Another uh, comment there, but sis is helping you out. Sis is a great trainer. Um, she's also using the Calm Dogs product. Um, if you're not familiar with Calm Dogs, this is not just something, some sponsor. I created Calm Dogs. It took me five years to develop a supplement that was natural, that actually worked. I mean, really worked, really helped dogs with anxiety, fears, phobias, dogs that are afraid of fireworks, storms, dogs with aggression, reactivity, dogs that might be afraid of car rides or grooming or vet visits. Go to calmdogs.com. You can learn all about it. It's made with 21 natural ingredients, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, Chinese herbs, Everything that's in there, there's nothing on the market that even comes close to it. It's five times stronger and has up to 80% more ingredients than anything out there. Go to calmdogs.com and check it out for your dog. So again, we've got the 4th of July coming up. Um, if you're just joining us and you've got a dog that has a fear of fireworks, please make sure that they're safe. Make sure that they've got a collar on. Make sure that they've got an ID tag. Make sure that they're chipped. Don't leave your dog at home. Make sure that you stay with them. Have things to distract them. Go into the quietest part of the house, like the closet. Put on some background music. Maybe you need to talk to your vet about getting something to help sedate your dog and keep your dog calm when the fireworks are going on. There's nothing wrong with situational medications. I talked earlier in the show when you talk to your veterinarian, you might want to try the medication before you actually have to use it. Some dogs have a paradoxical reaction. They become more anxious when they're sedated because they fear that they're losing their faculties. Um, some dogs, it helps them a, a great deal. Um, anyway, it's been a great show today. I appreciate everybody's questions. I appreciate sis. Thank you so much for talking about your experience with calm dogs. It's great. Especially when I hear another trainer talking about the calm dogs product. I really appreciate that. Um, keep your puppy safe. Um, make sure that you practice, practice, practice. Yeah. That sound means we are out of time folks, but I want to thank everybody that put a question in there. I want to thank all of you that are regular watchers and viewers. Please hit that like button, hit that share button so that more people can benefit from the show. I'll be back next Saturday, same time, 11 o'clock Eastern time. Have a great 4th of July weekend, everybody. I'm out of here. <laughs>